Okay, so the goddess Athena is the one who is the one you hear about, right? The one who is fighting for women's rights. And I think that, I think it's important to notice that on the one hand, you can't get anywhere unless those women have fought and broken down barriers. So their place in the among the goddesses is really important. But so are all the others. All the others are also important because um, Athena could break down barriers. She could make, you know, force governments to educate women. But if you don't have any good teachers, what difference does it make, right? So there need to be some women who decide they want to be a teacher. They might be more like Demeter. Um, there's also the case that parents, mothers have to encourage their daughters to get an education or else all the work that Athena did is worthless, you know, if the mothers don't encourage their daughters. Um, then there's, there's always in the back of the back of everybody's minds is that as we promote women's rights, we also have to be sustainable or else, uh, especially in developing countries, there will be more and more natural catastrophes. And so women can't make progress if the natural environment is becoming disrupted. So that means Artemis is also important. Um, and so, yeah, so again, okay, so here's another example. Athena might work to get laws against rape and sexual harassment and all that stuff, which is very important because without those laws, you know, men can do anything. It's also really important to have judges. So women need to get uh, appointed as judges so that the men are held accountable. Of course, men should also be good judges, but I think women need to get in there and then there needs to be enforcement of the law because perhaps a judge um, supposedly imprisons someone, but there's not enough follow through on it. So all of those aspects of it that Athena types have to break those barriers and get those institutions structured and get the laws applied. But um, if women don't also um, tell their husbands, right? Or if they know someone next door or some friend who's actually getting abused by her husband, they need to report it, <laughs> right? So that would be Hera. If Hera doesn't want to uh, get her husband in trouble or if things like that. So they all inter interact. But again, now that I've said that, I really want to talk about Athena because those are the women who make history or who get in the public eye and break down the barriers and change the structure. So I had you read a number of what my students had said. Uh, the last time I taught the course about the goddess Athena. So um, we can break into groups unless, unless you'd rather just all be together, right? Why don't you raise your hand? Because I think you prefer, I think you'd have a lot to say in your small groups. Is there anybody who would rather have it be just us together, each one reacting, rather than a breakout group?
Okay. Well, that's good. I'm glad. So I will put you into breakout groups and you should react, you know, pick which of those uh, examples that impressed you the most. And you also bring your own examples. So that should take a while. And after 15 minutes, I will go into the groups and see how, how you're doing. But I would imagine it would take time and I would love for you to just talk to each other about all the things you know about what's being done with women's rights in your countries. And this can be, it doesn't have to be political women either. It can be women in business who are fighting back to get um, employed or to the way they run their businesses is to promote women's rights within the business. Anyway, there's lots of possibilities. And that's what the reading that I gave you oh, gives you examples of all the things that you can think of. Um, so Rafa, I will make sure to um, call it, count you present. All right, so here we go into two breakout rooms. Oops. Was everybody able to, hopefully the stories, the examples that you got in the reading were hopefully helpful to inspire you to think of your own stories. But um, for next time, we'll go back to the Bolin book, right? And we'll read the section on Athena, but I will actually, we can go over parts of that right now. And, um, Let's see, I have to, um, here we go. No, this is, yeah, okay. All right, so here is the section from Bolin. Um, So the truth is, I, this is what I had planned to have you read. And the document said Athena, and I didn't look to see if it was the same one, but I think, you know, it isn't so bad. It gives you a chance to just jump right into it. And then, then you can read you know, after the fact, some of this stuff. So, all right. So I think you can tell from the reading for today that she was, she was concerned with justice, but she also liked the arts. And so some of the stories that the women, the students told were about um, the creativity, but the, the kind of creativity at Athena was engaged in tended to be really practical stuff. So Athena wants to govern human beings, but she also wants to give them clothing, pottery, you know, dressmakers, right? Because she has to get 
provide them with their basic needs in order that then they can start worrying about justice. So she helps them with survival and then she helps them with justice, setting up a legal system, setting up military, but um, military laws, uh, protections from security, national security, personal security, all, and then all the, the rights that women or citizens need in general. Um, so, so let me pause for a minute and um, clarify the difference between Artemis, Apollo, and Athena. So I was talking about that last time, and I hope you can figure that out this time. I mean, obviously they bleed into each other. The whole point is that you should try to tap into all these energies. But when somebody is really possessed by Athena, she's always calculating, right, how to achieve her goals. And sometimes she's indifferent to people, right? And sometimes she buys into the patriarchy because she wants to succeed. And in order to succeed, she has to accept all this uh, sexist stuff. So you could think about in your own countries, some of the women that have been able to achieve, excuse me, and you can think some of them actually play the guy's game as they move up. And once they get successful, they start to use the power and the money they have to promote women's rights. Oh, Roshani, do you have your hand up? Uh, yes, Professor. Um, so uh, while reading all this, like, you, do we have to particularly mention it like in our country or in our place? Or we can give an examples from the global um, personality as well? You can do, you could do either one. Um, okay. I do want you over time. I mean, you should, in a way, do both. I want you to have this class gives you an opportunity to find out about your country because it's your country and you'll probably, you're probably gonna end up living there. So the more you sort of know about the background of what's going on now, then when you go back there, I don't know, I mean, in 10 years or I'm not sure all what all of you have planned, if you have planned grad school and then international organizations, but I would imagine eventually you'd want to go home and help your country. But on the other hand, a lot of you will probably be abroad going to school and work. The UN will probably have a lot of impact on your lives. Various NGOs will. So whatever it is that you think really is in your interest to know and to learn more about would be what I'd like you to do. Does that answer your question? Um, yes, Professor. So uh, like my doubt was like, uh, it's like, um, I was not uh, getting exact, like, you know, examples of the personality fitting all the criteria, but uh, just uh, while dividing, uh, like taking just few of the things, like uh, edu not education, wisdom, intellectual, and um, this, you know, having empathy or feeling for the general people or others. I was thinking of Miss Alabama, uh, like who is very you know, brave in her words, brave in her activity, also like uh, very intelligent and uh, very wise enough. So I was thinking of Miss Alabama, but uh, she is like from the other part. So I, uh, I, I won't say like mm, I took her, like I, um, I like you know. I think of all these uh, things that I mentioned here, but uh, just uh, focusing on some of the specific things, uh, other than this, um, you know, um, other than this, some household. Uh, how do you how do you say uh, household like talenting talent things like making some things like this? But I would say uh, Michelle Obama uh, as one of the examples. But I don't know. I'm not sure actually if like she fits or not. Michelle but Michelle I, Obama. Yes, Professor. Yeah. I just uh, took it her as intelligent, wise, uh, wise, and very you know brave in her voice, and she is so powerful to me. Such an insp 
fighting lady. Well, she's she's concerned with social justice too, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I I don't I know if right. you know. Do you know how she met Barack Obama? It's kind of a funny story. <laughs> um, she was working at a law firm. So again, she's she's interested, right? She gets a degree in law. That's very much Athena. Um, but she was working for a big corporate firm. I'm not quite sure she wanted to stay in that job forever, but that was the way to beef up your CV, you know? Um, so then there was a potential candidate to hire into the law firm who was at what Harvard Law School and maybe he was a third year student or something. And so he was applying for a position or an internship or something uh, for the summer. I guess it was the summer between the second and third year of law school. So Michelle Obama was put in charge of helping him get a place to live and showing him how the law firm works and all that stuff. So she was actually the boss <laughs> when they first met and made a whole lot more money than he ever did. So that was kind of interesting. Um, it didn't take long either. By the end of the summer, it was pretty written in stone. But anyway, so I think Michelle Obama, she is, she's dedicated to um, justice. She's also comes across, right? Oh, she's also, her dad was a, just a postal worker. Yeah. And he had multiple. Do you know all this? You already know all this? I had actually read something about it. So uh, while going some of the things, I just, uh, you know, Michelle Obama's name just hit on my head. Like, yeah. I think she fit into it. Yeah, her dad encouraged her a lot. He had multiple sclerosis. He was in a wheelchair, I guess. Um, but yeah, she got all the support from both her parents. I think the ones that um, the ones that are interesting that come up in the public eye sometimes, or the ones that are painful, are the ones where the father's daughter ignores her mother or criticizes her mother, or um, it was really hard, and it might be hard in your countries too, but when that first wave of daughters is able to get out there and be successful. Sometimes they don't, you know, the mothers feel um, either the mothers don't want them to, or the mothers feel like they're being marginalized or ignored or their contribution isn't respected, right? And so that's always a problem or that can be a problem. Um, anyway, so it didn't, the thing about Michelle Obama, she wrote a book called, oh my gosh, Becoming or something. And somebody gave it to me for Christmas. So I started to read it, but I could not get through the first, after half of it because it, it's a political book. You know, it, it didn't contain anything negative and there's no way. <laughs> There's no way that it was really an authentic story. For example, one of her best friends was Jesse Jackson's daughter. And she went to high school with Jess. And but she never talked about what they actually talked about in politics. She just thought, oh, we were, you know, we were chums and we went, you know shopping together some dang thing. I mean, <laughs> it just wasn't. It was something to sell. It was political. It was getting everyone to sort of warm up to Michelle Obama. And that's that's the thing about politics. And it, it's it's related, right? So when women go into politics or when they become political players, um, they have to play the game, you know? like men do. And then it's just a question of how much do they defend the patriarchy? How much do they criticize women who criticize the patriarchy? 
Um, and you will run across examples where it seems like they're it seems like they go too far. Um, but those are things when you when that happens, that's why I want you to read this material because lots of times you don't anticipate that this is going to happen, right? You think, oh, that's a successful woman. She's going to help women. And it's a shock for people when they don't. And um, I had, I ran into this three different times. I ran into a queen bee, okay? And it was such a shock. And then when I finally read about the Athena archetype, I go, oh, this is like normal. And if I had known that ahead of time, I wouldn't have been quite as thrown off by it. Um, the first time, let's see. Well, the first time it happened, um, it was one of my best friends. She got promoted to be the dean in this department I was in. And somebody invited me to a meeting about how are things going at the school? And I said, you know, the philosophy department teaches St. Thomas Aquinas. Like they all assume that that is the philosophy. And the trouble was he was sexist. He said, women are not capable. They are designed to be the helpmate for men, but the school accepts women and takes their money so it just seemed to me that you should have some kind of disclaimer that says, we agree with St. Thomas except for his sexism. We all think women are equal. You know, that seemed reasonable, right? Oh my gosh, that apparently that created this huge, huge, you know, upset. Um, everybody in the philosophy department was really mad at me. And I wasn't Catholic, I was the only non-Catholic. And so she called me into her office. And <laughs> she said, was there anything we did? Do you like the way you've been treated? Uh, because, you know, it wasn't good for you to, to say stuff like that about the philosophy department. <laughs> <I'm> like, what? <laughs> so we didn't talk to each other for a while. I mean, I hope this story resonates. I mean, I hope it's somewhat helpful because I really want you to be prepared because it threw me off so badly. I, you know, I was juggling enough stuff and then have one of my very best friends turn on me like that. And I don't think it, it, it's abnormal, but another, I do think at AUW, you get enough of a positive environment and the students get it, you know? So many women students that are going to college now are going in these male dominated schools, schools that maybe, maybe some of the women take one or two courses about gender, but it's not, it is not the climate of the campus. And so they do adapt the, the patriarchy and they don't try to change the paradigm. And they just keep moving up and they keep getting rewarded. So any woman who tries to challenge it. So I am I think honestly, by coming to AUW, you have an advantage there that you, you won't turn into one of these women that diss other women. Um, but who knows? I mostly I just I'm just warning you. Um, try not to get too upset about it. Try not to be too surprised about it. Um, another time I had this was I had tenure and I was established. And I I had a five-year review, and I was just feeling like this is gonna be such closure because I published four books in five years and 12 articles. And I just thought, wow, you know, I finally made it. Well, this woman just trashed me, the woman Dean. She just told me the publisher isn't good enough. 
and you need to publish with the uh, university press and nobody cares about your Fulbright to Indonesia. And it's just like, I got a Fulbright, you know, to go to Indonesia. And she, it was really awful. It really threw me off. So that's just to give you some examples where that's one other thing for you to kind of watch out for, but don't do it. You know? <laughs> don't, don't go that route. Um, there are lots of great men and, and hopefully you're going to be able to succeed in the patriarchy and that's wonderful. But don't forget, you know, that so many women suffer and try to, you know, help them move along. Um, so you all have to calculate. Um, so here's the difference between Artemis and Apollo and Athena. The Artemis woman might just want to hang out in, in the natural world and doesn't, you know, not every aspect of her life is calculated for her own um, ecofeminism, right? She wants to be, to protect the environment. But if she's just an Artemis, she's not going to want to like start an organization or run an organization. Um, she's going to have to have a lot of Athena strategizing and calculating and finding donors. That's a different um, energy. It's a different goddess. So, um, and then the Apollo woman just likes science, you know, and she just wants to keep exploring the science or the math or some other just intellectual um, curiosity, but she doesn't figure out like the woman in the videotape. That woman also made a business out of it, right? So she took this capacity and calculated and planned. And, you know, she had a lot of Athena in her. But just a woman who just focused on science would, may, you know, not be very good at someone would have to tell her, oh, you could make this into a product and sell it, you know? It probably wouldn't be something that, it wouldn't even occur to her or else if it did, she really wouldn't have the energy. She would just want to discover more um, in her field. So, so that would be the difference. I hope, I hope that, um, I hope that makes intuitive sense to you because, you might, you know, you're going to figure out eventually what thing you really honestly like best, but you are going to have to do all these things too. Um, all right, so that's kind of a lot of talking on my part. Um, let's see. Uh, keeping your head. Um, uh, the other thing that comes up is that in those writings by the students was the she's a father's daughter right and she's um she's very practical right um she enjoys being in the midst of male action and power um she's realistic um pragmatic so maybe some other feminist would have some other ideas the Athena would go, yeah, but it's not possible. We have to do what works. And then diplomacy is a big one for her. So I don't know if you have, if there's some women diplomats in your country, but uh, Susan Rice, Madeleine Albright, you know, there are a number of them in the US that really stand out as diplomats. Um, Samantha Powell, power, Samantha Power. Anyway, you can keep your eye out for that because, well, the United Nations has many women who are engaged in that kind of diplomatic activity. So, you know, you might want to check that out for your paper. You might want to look up. Um, one of my students last time I taught the class, Ratana. She wants to be a diplomat. 
And so she did research. Her research paper was about women in diplomacy. And in her country, which was Cambodia, there wasn't a lot, right? But I just said, Ratana, you are going to be it, right? You are going to be the pioneer. You are going to carve out this space that hasn't been there. So I really do encourage you to think about what you feel most passionate about and then look at, see if there's research because that's how you can also, well, you can have a role model from the past or the present. You can get networking. You can find out organizations to network with. And if there isn't a lot, you can envision that, you know, by the time you're my age, but way before that, <laughs> you will have carved out something that you know wasn't there before. So that's all really important. Um, let's see. So I talked about my own. See, my situation, my father was an activist. He really, I mean, he was famous as an activist. Everybody that knew my parents were absolutely amazed at how much they got done and how many connections they had made and all this stuff. Uh, but they were never home, <laughs> right? That's, that's kind of a problem. But... Um, when I came of age, I cared, I care so much about that, but I absolutely cannot live that way. I'm a contemplative, I'm not, I'm a thinker. And so when my father always said, don't just talk about it, do something. But I, when I was demonstrating in the Vietnam War, I realized a lot of people are in this for the wrong reason. They're just in it to protect their own skin, just to be with their friends. It, and so my answer to that was don't just do something, think about it, right? You have to be doing this for the right reason. If you don't, it's not going to last. And so there are a lot of people who think of the 60s generation as just a bunch of narcissistic, self-absorbed, uh, self-indulgent uh, teenagers, you know, college students, but it wasn't, you know, it was about American imperialism, but it matters, you know, why you're doing what you're doing and how you do it. And you make sure to articulate, it's about American imperialism. It's about killing innocent people. It's about, you know, the power drive. So, so that was just a really tough thing for me. And that's just an example of how you can really believe in something and really care about it, but it's not your goddess, right? It's not your energy. So you encourage other people to do it. That's what I do, right? I wrote a book about this so that other women can figure out what inspires them. Um, so the other thing um, about, yeah, I was a daddy's girl, uh, no question about that. But I got along with my mother. So I treated my mother the way my dad treated my mother, <laughs> right? Which was, she's a nice lady and you're always nice to her. But when it got to the serious stuff, okay, that's my dad. Um, so you can, you think about that. My father gave me these really, really deep books to read starting in fifth grade. I mean, he gave me another book in high school. Uh, let's see. Anyway, it was 800 pages, you know, <laughs> and it was about Eros and it was, um, I mean, I liked it, I think, you know, but but I sort of rose to the occasion. Like it was, oh, my dad respects me and thinks I'm serious or wants me to think about this stuff. Um, so I kind of responded to that. Um, let's see. 
another big problem I had was that when I had kids, all of a sudden I realized that my dad was never the primary caregiver of the children. You know, my mother was. And so here I am. I want to go out there and save the world. But I also am very aware that my children need me. And so um, that was that was very conflicting. But I think a lot of women run into that, that juggling, um, even in the US, right? Balancing family and career is really a difficult problem. Um, okay, the other, the point here where it says that she defends the patriarchy. Well, my father was critical of the patriarchy. He criticized the Vietnam War. He criticized environmental destruction. He criticized um, racism. He criticized religious bigotry. So he was always challenging the status quo. And so when I was a father's daughter, I didn't have that problem, right? It wasn't um, defending the status quo. Let's see. So interfaith dialogue. That's why I teach a course in world philosophies where we talk about Confucianism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, and Christianity, and the Greeks, because I focus on the similar virtues, the similar teachings. But that started when I was young. There was a huge movement in the US for interfaith dialogue, uh, breaking down the different religious traditions. And so, of course, it's really disappointing when my country is more religiously bigoted now than certainly than wherever anybody I knew about growing up. Um, civil rights, the Vietnam War was a big deal, the environmental movement. Um, oh yeah, this might, you might identify with this. I wanted to get good grades and get out of this town, right? This is a provincial town. I don't care about what people think about. I'm out of here, right? And education is gonna be the tool for me to get out of here. Um, that's what we talked about last time. And Malala, I've, I'm gonna definitely assign that next time. All right. Um, I, this is all a lot of more just specifics to my life, probably not. Okay, the other, another theme that comes up is the inner father and then the outer father, right? So, so you internalize this view of your, okay, that's not what I want. Okay. I can't remember where it was on the, on my page, but this idea that when you're growing up, you get these ideas about your mother and your father, and you internalize something that might not even be who they are or what they expect of you. You just sort of felt that that was what your parents wanted or didn't want or whatever. And sometimes parents are not honest about that. Um, I had a friend whose mother really did want him to get rich because she'd been a doctor's daughter and then she married a salesman and she went down in the socials. I don't, I can't imagine she ever told him that, but he did that. He was a good mommy's boy, but it didn't make him happy. He became a very rich lawyer, but he really wanted to be a college professor, right? And so you have that, you have this inner father who you think, you know, wants, expects this or that. And oftentimes that inner father is inaccurate or really hard on you more than your actual father. <laughs> but you never know. I mean, some, some of some students, a lot of AW students were encouraged by their fathers or some 
you know, or grandfathers or brothers, something. Um, but if not, they had to fight, right? They had to fight for their right to an education. And that's just, each of us has to go through different, you know, trials, different ways to achieve, to become fully human. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, I got kicked out of graduate school because I wanted to spend time with my um, children. That was a big problem. Um, all right, the kind of husband you're looking for, you can think about that. What kind of a husband do you think you like? Um, this is Hillary Clinton is another obvious case, right? And she definitely <laughs> calculated who she was gonna marry. Um, apparently Bill Clinton proposed long before she accepted, however. Um, then the kind of teacher she is, the kind of mother she is. Um, I think that's, I don't know if you have an example of an older woman, it's the kind of grandmother she is. Um, the dark side though, right, is to defend the patriarchy. And that that's really hard on women who assume that the women who succeed are going to help them, help pull them up. And we have a whole lot of women now who defend the patriarchy in the US. Um, then the other thing is to intimidate others, to be very judgmental toward people that aren't successful or that aren't interested in what she's interested in. Um, so that's, that's always a problem with an archetype. It's very hard to get outside of your own archetype and accept other people for who they are. Um, okay, I think I'm just about done. The US today, okay, I guess that's, that's good enough. Um, and the other thing I was going to, okay. So I also have these quotes from various essays and books about women in politics, the father-daughter relationship. You don't have to read this, this is all just optional, but if you'd like to, um, for a long time I just read all these books because I wanted to find a voice, right? And I found out that all these pretty famous women had had these really difficult, coming of age experiences in their relation to their fathers. So that was helpful, right? It just helps you understand um, that you're, you know, you struggle, you have your successes and, and, and failures or your obstacles and all of the people the world calls successful have had to struggle and they failed a lot and they, they just pick themselves up, right? And carry on. So that's quite a big section on women's psychological health under patriarchy, how difficult that is. Then there's women's economic vulnerability and they're, you know, they can't establish businesses, they can't function, um, they can't get promoted within the business world. Then there's women who want to be intellectually, want to achieve, right? They want to get a tenure track job, get tenure. That's all the Athena kind of stuff. And that gets thwarted. Um, and so they, they just start becoming aware of all, how everything they loved, they might've loved a lot of other things, but they get caught in power situations where men are, have power they don't have and they're abusing that power and so all of a sudden you know power becomes this huge issue and that's the Athena thing 
Um, let's see. The path out of patriarchy. How do you get out? And then there's a lot of women rec with um, recommendations for how to change, how to change psychological research so that it's not biased, how to change um, the way we think about spirituality, the way we think uh, politics. Um, so that was that section. Then for next time, I wanted you to, um, so for next time I wanted, you to bring, wait, let's see. You have to start working on your research papers. Okay. And I found some, I think that there, there's just tons of stuff out there. So here's a 30 page article about um, the women's movement in Bangladesh. If some of you wanna look at that. Um, this is the women's movement. Oh, this is uh, Professor Naomi gave me these documents. I couldn't access them. So I went and found some other stuff just online. Women's Action Forum, activism in, in Pakistan. There's a whole lot of stuff on India. Um, so try to familiar you know, get familiar with all the movements that are going on. Um, let's see. Let me just ask you if you have any questions or comments. Ma'am? Yep. Are you sure right now the women's movement in Bangladesh, some of the movements, right? Uh, that that one you showed just right now? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is there something about uh, any organization there? Oh, well, I think so. Um, that would be, I would imagine, but we can go look. Um, yeah, because I know something about our organization. I told you last class that you said you have some links. Oh, let's see. Yeah, actually that was what I was looking for and I didn't get access to them, but I'm sure, I mean, they're just, there's so much that goes on out there and they do give you access. So the, here's the history of the feminist movement. And I do think in college, it's good to get the history. Um, so whatever country you're in, I would spend some time finding the history of the women's movement in your country because what you see in front of your face and what you an anticipate or envision moving forward is going to depend, is going to be affected by the background, right? Who started things? What part of your country was the most progressive? Which leaders? Uh, what are the figure, the big figureheads? Um, was what were the reactionary movements, right? In which places or which religions or which sectors is it have women had the most difficulty? Um, so here's the during the British occupation. How did that start, right? Um, so then there's the Pakistan period, right? The British Pakistan and Bangladesh. Um, present day activism. So um, I, I mean, I could scroll. Oh, another issue that I think, um, yeah, this is really important. The presence of women's religious groups. So if you wanted to do research about uh, women, Muslim feminists, right? So women who are Muslim, unapologetically Muslim and feminist, and they think it goes together and there are a number of AUW students that uh, know that they were raised that way. 
But what's the history behind it? Is the conservative backlash, is that mostly based on religion or something else, right? And then the growing presence of women's religious groups means that women's religious groups are becoming more progressive and they're promoting women's rights. So that's really important in your generation, no matter where you live in Southeast Asia, but especially in, in Muslim countries or Muslim, predominantly Muslim or Muslim areas of a country, that if you can get women to associate their religion with promoting women's rights, that's really what you have to do to make big progress. So if you would like to do a research paper on that, if there are specific women's religious groups, well, I mean, here they're, they're listed in here, right? So, so I didn't read this document, but I would imagine, you know, it says it has all that information in it. So what you should ask yourself first is what do I really want to learn about, right? that I can take with me moving forward. Um, the teacher isn't telling me to read this or that, but she's making me think, right? I don't wanna waste my time doing research on something that isn't meaningful to me or that, um, yeah, that I'm not gonna be able to use moving forward in my life. So that would be my um, suggestion. Let's see. Um, I guess that's that's all I have right there. Any other questions? Well, let's see. Um, why don't I um, why don't I just ask each of you um, just you know, put you on the spot and say, what did you gain the most? Um, how are you processing this studying of Artemis, Apollo and Athena, these different goddesses? Like how would you summarize what you're taking in from studying this material, okay? Like that's, that's a tough, order. But on the other hand, um, this is what I always want you to do is to be reflective. Because otherwise, you, you know, what you learn just sort of comes in and comes out, and it doesn't stick in your head. But what, do, what is starting to stick in your head about what we've done so far? And then I will let you out early. Because I do want to give you a chance to read that chapter on Artemis that quotes from uh, Dr. Bolin, but I do want us to move on also. So I'll give you a little more time to read that. You're not going to get caught if you don't read it, but I would like you to. If, um, I, think, I think you'll gain more from the class if you keep reading from chapters in my book. Um, okay, here's Ko 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 uh, Koala, I, I don't know how to pronounce your name, but as I read about Athena, a girl I know came to my mind. Um, she's 33, independent leader, finished high school, fought against her family's habits, completed her BA and her MA. Uh, her dad died when she was 28. She became the only helper for the family because she was the eldest and had all sisters. Um, she used to work and spend. She was not satisfied with marriage, so she wouldn't leave her family alone. Um, so she's basically taking responsibility for her family. There are just a lot of them out there. Not all, you know, many of them never get in the public eye. They never get the kind of respect that the ones who make it into positions of power and money get. Um, but okay, Melanie, let's start. What, would, what is your takeaway so far 
from studying these different um, goddess archetypes. Are you there? Okay, Marzia. Uh, Marzia, you've been in such a crisis situation. And a lot of times in a crisis, that's when the, a woman's a people's archetypes really kick in. Does that make sense? Professor, sorry? Well, lots of times you've been in such a crisis situation. Uh -huh. and, that, and that's when people, you know, people who are natural leaders step up and they start you know, controlling the situation or people who are, people kind of get exposed when they're in a critical moment. So can you, anyway, what are you basically gaining out of my class while you're sitting, going through this huge life-changing experience? And what I personally do, you mean? Yeah, personally, yep. Uh, Professor, uh, right now uh, I'm in India and I'm not Indian, but I live in India. So it's so difficult to have the same opportunities that an Indian has in India because of like citizenship, something like that. And it has been maybe um, more than three months that I left Afghanistan. And right now, uh, yeah, it's um, critical time for me personally and for what is going on on my country, which I feel, uh, but uh, what I right now, what I think that I can do to make a better difference is that to keep balance as much as I can and continue. Uh, and I think it will take time to heal, but it's not impossible. And I will, I will try to keep balance, keep going, and hope and be hopeful for the future, not only for myself, for women of my country and my country. So which, which aspect of women's empowerment do you think you might take on? What, what matters the most to you? For me, what matters is, I think, education, the problem, like if if we educate women, they probably and they will know about their rights. They will know about their uh, like uh, the. I'm sorry, is your noise? They will know about their rights. They will know uh, that uh, how to fight. Uh, and right now, the women who fight are those who are educated. Those who are not educated, they accept the situation. I think that what 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 is important is getting education and using it after getting it. So I think what can bring changes is to provide education opportunities for women. Uh, and and I think that we should not we should let them to fly. We, we should we should not close the women's way. Uh, one thing that bothers me a lot for the situation of women, especially in my country, is that people feel pity for women. I don't like it. Women, like, I, I mean that um, uh, we should not say that, oh, for women, oh, for women, because when we say it, or when we use this for word for women, they probably will feel poor. We should say that, yeah, women are as equal as, as men. If we cannot support them, at least we should not close their ways. I think if we lead them and if we do not close their ways, they will probably find their way. Right. So here's the thing. When you, when you say education matters, some women will say, yes, I want to start an NGO that um, provides opportunities for women to, to get to school or something like that, or I want to start a business building schools, or I want to start a business creating educational materials that are not sexist. Or you can say, I want to be the teacher in the classroom that takes each student and brings them, you know, to 
to a better place. Do you see what I mean, Marzia? Uh, like you want to ask uh, truly that what I want to do, right? Yeah, which aspect of the education? Uh, I, I did not think about this, that uh, exactly a teacher or an NGO manager or organizer. I just think about this, that uh, they, first of all, I have to empower myself because without empowering my, myself, I cannot help others. Second, I just, till this time, I just think about this, that how to find ways, maybe an NGO or maybe an, another organization to, pro, to provide education facilities. Not, I, I, not only for women, for children, for girls, for boys, for any human beings are needed. But what, uh, what is my focus is mostly probably women because women are the most vulnerable uh, part of the society. So I think maybe some organization uh, or uh, yeah, uh, or something that uh, uh, through that or via that I can be help, helpful. Okay, good. So Amina, what about you? How are you processing all this um, information? Yes, Rahima, that's good. That's true. <laughs> So Amina, what would you say is, um, yeah, what your, what your takeaway is from studying the material? How are you making sense out of this? Okay. So I'll come back to you. What about Rahima? What about you? Oh. Like, frankly speaking, ma'am, right now, this course is like going up to my head because I joined the like, uh, like, I joined your course a bit late, a bit later. So that's why it's like, uh, I was like, I can't, I, I'm just can't making up uh, with other, other courses. Like, how to say, I don't know, it just was so messed up for me. I didn't even write any of your posts yet because, like, uh, I'm reading. Uh, for uh, like what you are giving for every classes and and I have to take uh, and uh, the other process you have given before so I have to uh, come out like how to say I have I have to uh, I don't know how to say but uh, I'm like messed up with this course material money with this course material actually okay well you can always come to office hours okay That'll... No, but uh, I have other three courses, so that's why I'm like messed up. I have to uh, uh, take time for these courses also. They are also giving so much assignments and quizzes and uh, exams, so that's why I'm just, I just can't cope up with all of this. Okay. So yeah, I, will, I will take your appointments and we'll uh, settle up everything. Okay, well, you can just, anyway, we can talk about that some other time, but yeah, I just want to ask, what you know in general in terms of the content so if you can't keep up with it you can meet with me and whatever when you have time um toma did you have any do you want to have say anything any wrap-up thing about how you're making sense out of all of this uh, for me sometimes uh, uh, it's the things like um, bad going bad but um, in some cases i am feeling okay because it's it, i need to do other things at the same time so of course um, i need to cooperate uh, with all the materials and uh, it will going well ma'am for me okay okay so all right jacinta i also wanted like specifically um, are you thinking about what it is you really are passionate about? Are you, are you able to understand that some women are, women are different, right? They get really passionate about different things and they need to respect each other or something like that. That's what I'm trying to, to tap into your brain and see how you're processing it. But 
we are going to run out of time. So is there anybody who wants to comment about this? Otherwise, I'll just let you go. Um, So I, I wonder if you talk to your mothers or sisters or um, other friends or teachers about how to, you know, maneuver all these ups and downs. Um, just things like running into a queen bee, you know, a woman who defends the patriarchy. I, have you ever talked to another woman who's gotten in this situation? Have you ever, like, is the material helping you to understand some experiences you've had? And you can understand that, oh, this happens to other people. Like, I'm not alone in this. Um, and that, that just helps, right? It helps if you know, oh, this is a pattern. And I have to, you know, what is the wisest way to move beyond this obstacle or to take advantage of what I really care about, right? So I'm just wondering if the um, material is helping you sort of understand your life, <laughs> where it's been and where it is and where you want to take it. So does anybody else want to make a comment? Um, Otherwise, the posts, you know, I talked quite a bit about the posts last time and about the papers, and they're coming due in a couple weeks. Um, and I would encourage you to read that section about Athena from the Bolin book. I don't think I'll require it, but I think you could probably get the most out of the class if you do it. And then I'll post some more things for next week. Um, any other questions or comments? Because I won't close the classroom down. I'll let you go, it's just five minutes early. And then if anybody wants to stay after to ask me a question, I'll just be here. What? Professor, uh, how many words we have to cover for our research paper? It says all the requirements are there on the syllabus. So you should look it up because, you know, it has a lot of, it, it also, I think, is on the, the class, you know, the what assignments post um, because it also has the number of short quotes it has how you do those quotes i mean it has a lot of stuff so you ought to just look at that okay professor thank you sure yes you may leave everybody can leave um Bye-bye, Professor. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank I you, hope Professor. Can, yeah, I hope we can all catch up. I didn't. Thank you, Professor. Of course. Bye, Professor. Thank you. Of course. Bye-bye. So Rafa, did you get enough of the class or do you wanna talk at all about the class if you missed some? Or you can always go to the YouTube, right? 